Our connections make powerful things happen, uniting individuals and communities. We are Rotary. We are people of action. And together, we turn great ideas into reality by accessing our networks, our experience, and the best of ourselves to make a difference. Around the world, Rotary brings leaders together to build new friendships and to solve problems. Like in Austria, where generations work side by side to come up with innovative ways to build sustainable housing and community centers. Everyone learning from each other. In India, volunteers run a mobile blood bank to help provide a steady blood supply for their local community. And in Taiwan, people are working hard to get vulnerable citizens the support and services they need. With over one million members, we know what people can do when they come together. In your backyard and around the world, there's power in our connections. Take action with us. Find out more at rotary.org. And welcome to the Rotary Club of San Dimas meeting for April 28th, 2021. It is my pleasure to introduce our president, Diva Alfaro. Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Um, so excited to have everybody here with us. And I'd like to go ahead and pass it to um, Carissa for the Pledge of Allegiance. I think she's logging on right now. She just got off a work call, so. Well then, Lauren, why don't we have you do it? All right. Um, are you guys ready? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one night. <laughs> Sorry. You guys got me off guard. Um, one nation. One nation under God for which it stands. Indivisible. 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 For which it stands. Indivisible. With truth. Come on. Oh, yeah. Wait, wait, wait what, what's next? Sorry, I messed it all up. Chris, you caught me off guard. So you want to take over? It's a perfect introduction to the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you so much. Okay. All righty. Thank you so much. So next is the invocation. Do we have Casey? Casey is not present. We'll okay. move on. Okay, so next I'll do introductions. Um, now, my, again, my name is Dee Balfaro. I am the Ascending West Club president. I've been in Rotary for about uh, three years or so now, and I am a licensed loan officer, uh, and I serve basically the nation. <laughs> I'll go ahead and pass it on to Raymond. Hi, Raymond Foster, uh, past president twice, president-elect, and welcome to the San Dimas Rotary Club. Thank you. I'll go ahead and pass it on to Lauren. Hi, Lord Ferrari. I'm a resident in San Dimas and happy to be here. Thank you so much. Uh, Mike. Hi, everyone. Uh, Mike Wallace. I am the president of Better Home Financial. Uh, we are a mortgage brokerage here in downtown San Dimas. Uh, I've been a Rotarian for about six years now past president, past treasurer, uh, and I am happy to be here and to see everybody today. Thank you, Mike. Derek? My name is Derek Papineau. I'm a teacher, a school board member, and a new Rotary member, so great to see everyone. Thank you, Derek. Steve? Hello, everyone. My name is Steve Scott. I am the current treasurer of the club, past president as well. I've uh, been a member for about 11 years, and I am a State Farm agent in San Dimas. Thank you, Steve. Uh, Marianne? Mm. Okay. Well, I'll go ahead and uh, before I introduce our guest speakers, uh, we have a short video. So I will go ahead and pass it on to Raymond. It's a wonderful and complex world out there, filled with challenges and opportunities. 
That's why America's diplomats with the U.S. Department of State are on the job every day representing you. We are advancing America's foreign policy interests by uniting our allies, confronting our adversaries, and protecting our citizens. We advance democracy, human rights, global health, and more. We grow markets that create American jobs. We are America's first federal agency, and we're in 190 countries at over 270 U.S. embassies and consulates serving you. We are the United States Department of State. What a great video. Thank you, Raymond. So today I have the pleasure of introducing um, our guest speaker, Erica Lewis. Erica joined the U.S. Department of State uh, as a Foreign Service Officer in 2009 and currently serves as a AU uh, Multilateral Affairs Officer at the State Department headquarters uh, in um, Washington, D.C. Prior to this assignment, she completed a six-month economic studies course at the Foreign Service Institute and follow-on uh, detailed assignments. Erica's other State Department headquarters assignments include serving as the um, Iraq coordinator in the Near Eastern Affairs Bureau of Office of Assistance um, Coordination and the um, Caribbean Quarter uh, Corridor in the Office of the Foreign, uh, of Foreign Assistance. Sorry about that. Um, her overseas assignments include uh, work in the uh, consular and uh, political sections of the U.S. Embassy in, I, you know, I cannot pronounce that, so I'm not going to try. <laughs> and um, in, uh, let's see, and also a consular officer in um, Juarez, Mexico. Uh, prior to joining the uh, Foreign Service, Erica completed the internships in the U.S. Embassy in um, Ecuador and in Freedom Town, Sierra, uh, Sierra Leone, with the uh, State Foreign Relations Committee in the office and of the retired Congressman Charles B. Rangel. Uh, she graduated with a Master's in Public Policy Analysis from Pepperdine University and has a bachelor's degree in international business with uh, concentration in African studies from um, Howard University. Erica is from Chicago, Illinois, and is married with three children. Thank you very much for joining us today, Erica. Go ahead and I pass it on to you. Thank you very much. Uh, definitely considered a privilege to share with you all today. And I will keep kind of my comments relatively brief. First, I just want to share a little bit of the overall foreign policy priorities of the current administration, and then share a little bit about the AS specific context. Then I'll speak a little bit about my office and the work and definitely welcome any questions if you all have them. Um, well, first on March 3rd, the National Security Council released President Biden's interim national security guidance. We don't have like yet our full rollout of national security guidance, but that initial guidance basically rests on one proposition, and that's that our domestic renewal is going to depend on us renewing our standing in the world and vice versa. So just really the interconnectedness of that. So a lot of the administration's focus is going to be on global engagement and also multilateral engagement. Um, so some of those top priorities within that first are uh, defeating the COVID-19 pandemic, um, also recovering from the economic crisis, building back better, as I'm sure you all have heard the motto since even since the beginning of the campaign, tackling the climate crisis, renewing democracy, um, also engaging more in the cyberspace, um, in particular in the African context. I'll talk a little bit about this later. Uh, dealing effectively with uh, unprecedented levels of migration around the world, including at our southern border, and then responding to what we consider one of the greatest strategic competitors of our time today, which is the People's Republic of China. So specifically in the Africa context, Africa is very important for this administration. We saw that President Biden's first speech to a foreign audience was delivered to Africans on the eve of the African Union Summit, uh, which took place in February of this year. The African Union essentially is the 
convening power for the majority of African countries. It represents 55 African member states. That includes the Western Sahara country, which we don't officially recognize as a country, but the African Union does. So that's how you get up to 55 member states, whereas we only consider there being 54 countries on the continent. Um, and so we saw that emphasis early on. And in addition to just wanting to engage more with the African Union, um, there's also the desire to increase trade and investment substantially. I'm not sure if you all have heard of Prosper Africa, but it was an administration priority under the Trump administration. It's one that continues under the Biden administration. And the idea is essentially to bring together all of the tools that the US government has, basically 18 US government agencies work on economic development priorities, bringing all those resources to bear so that for instance, if a US company is interested in trying to sell a certain product to a certain African country or just to enter a market in some other way, we are able to bring all of those resources to bear, Small Business Administration, Department of Commerce, Department of State, to be able to support and try to make deals where we can. Um, also leveling the playing field, and this ties in a little bit what I mentioned with the um, strategic competition with China. Some research indicates that um, African countries, the presence of malign activity of Chinese companies might make them more susceptible to economic upheaval. And so as partners, part of our strategic objective with African countries is to try to level the playing field to make sure that you know, products have a certain um, standard of quality, making sure that um, loans are drafted and put together in such a way that they're not gonna negatively impact a, a country's ability to be able to repay or to be able to access other financing through the IMF, for instance, if, if they have um, a significant number of defaults, et cetera. Um, so this is something that we're working to do through a number of different agencies and tools that we have. So really that economic piece is key for us. Uh, when you look at our engagement on the continent. Uh, next, peace and security as always, and I'll just mention a few of the countries that have been priorities for us. Um, we have the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, as you all know, the Ebola crisis essentially ended there at the end of last year, but there were a few new cases that popped up in Guinea and a few other West African countries this year. Again, trying to um, stop the spread also of COVID-19 across the continent. The US government has provided nearly 2000 ventilators to African countries to support their COVID-19 efforts. We also provided over $488 million to support COVID-19 response activities. And that's not even counting under the Biden administration. There's been a $2 billion commitment made to provide um, vaccines to um, countries that may not have the ability to be able to afford them. So whereas right now as, you know, individual, comp individual companies, so Johnson & Johnson and Pfizer, they both have agreements with the African Union to be able to provide vaccines to countries that can afford them. The Global Vaccine Alliance and this COVAX um, funding is, is looking to provide vaccines from other sources, other vendors as well, up to 500 million to support um, global vaccination. Um, in addition, Somalia, Sudan continue to be issues unrest in the Sahel and also counterterrorism. Um, the ISIS kind of spinoff groups that you see in Mozambique and us trying to provide resources um, for the Mozambican military and other partners in the region to be able to, to fight terrorism there. Uh, health security, as I mentioned, a lot of the COVID-19 support that we've provided, but more than that, we've provided probably more than $20 billion to the African continent through a number of different health means over the past 20 years. Um, the president's emergency plan for AIDS relief, which was actually started under the Bush administration, uh, continues on the continent. More than 11 million Africans are currently receiving treatment for um, HIV AIDS through the PEPFAR initiative, and that's U.S. government supported and funded. Um, you also have um, initiatives to support climate change adaptation. Uh, the African continent as a whole is considered to be probably the most vulnerable continent to the effects of climate change. Um, I'll be moving to Lesotho in July for my next post. It's a small landlocked country within South Africa. And one thing there is, you know, probably more than 70% of the country is dependent upon hydroelectric power. And so as you look at the effects of climate change, you've seen in recent years, them being unable to fill up the dams all the way, things like that. And how is that gonna actually impact the ability for 
them to power their hospitals and power their homes and things like that long term. So that's definitely a big priority um, for, for us at the Department of State to continue to try to help African countries adapt to climate change. Um, also with that, uh, we see youth empowerment. More than 60% of the African continent um, is uh, under the age of 25, 60% um, of Africans. And so with that, you have challenges as well as opportunities. And so started under the Obama administration was the Young African Leadership Initiative. And that seeks to connect Africans across the continent to be able to share resources and best practices. That network now has more than half a million members. Um, in addition to that, another thing I'll mention just as it relates to the strategic competition with China is that we have a number of African countries that have joined the Belt and Road Initiative, um, and you've seen Chinese trade as well as loans increase significantly since uh, 2000. So to the extent that we can come in and offer an alternative and also provide technical assistance for what we think has tremendous potential, I'm super excited about this. Um, this year, the African Continental Free Trade Area entered into force, and it's essentially going to create the largest trading bloc since the founding of the World Trade Organization um, on the African continent. And there's, you know, trillions of dollars of potential investment in trade um, that can get off the ground now that this uh, free trade area has been created within the African continent, primarily to increase intra-African trade. But as you're doing that, you're going to be able to address some of the issues that have kept U.S. companies and other companies from being able to enter the African market, primarily infrastructure development being key, right? There's no reason you shouldn't be able to get from the port of Dakar, Senegal, to some of the more interior countries, to Rwanda, for instance, and it's because of a lack of roads and and um, and streamlines for supply chains, et cetera, uh, across the continent. So we really do see a lot of potential there. Um, so those are kind of just the overall comments I'd share about where the administration's priorities are, where our priorities are. And you heard me mention probably our last four presidents and it's because I've been uh, with the department now for quite some time. And as a foreign service officer, we work for whoever is in power. Um, we're happy to be able to support whatever foreign policy priorities um, ex exist at that time um, and that the administration is pursuing. Um, and as you see, there are some initiatives that were started 12 years ago under one administration that have continued today. Um, I found that in my experience as a foreign service officer, not too much actually changes when your overarching goal are to increase prosperity, um, increase economic development around the world. Um, and so with my office in particular, I work in the Africa Bureau right now, the department. The department represents more than 70,000 employees. Foreign service officers are roughly 8,000. Um, and I'm one of those foreign service officers right now, just serving domestically. I'm calling in now from Maryland, but working in the DC area. Teleworking now is, is most, most of us may be around the country still. Um, but my office is split up into a number of different portfolios. I have a team that covers democracy and governance, one covers economic development, one covers multilateral affairs, and that's where I sit. I'm the African Union desk officer. Um, and then one that kind of covers strategic planning, our foreign assistance. Um, so just to give you a sense of the scope of what that looks like, for Sub-Saharan Africa, the U.S. government, the Department of State, and the U.S. Agency for International Development, we submit a joint budget to Congress. Uh, we provided roughly $8.5 billion to Sub-Saharan Africa in fiscal year 2020. Of that, $5 billion was dedicated for health programming. So it's the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief that I mentioned. It's the COVID-19 support, those type of um, resources. And that's pretty much been the same since I've been uh, in the department. The vast majority of our programming to the African continent and what we're providing money for is for health programming. Um, one thing that I'd say also that's interesting to, to note about the department is I feel that being a foreign service officer there, we have a great deal of ownership over our portfolios. We're able to, we're able to cover a broad range of issues. The reason I'm able to speak to you today about a number of different things across the continent is because I'm kind of sitting on this AU desk, which is essentially, you know, the EU version for the, the, the African continent. So, you know, covers a broad range of countries and issues. Um, and also I feel that the leadership of the department throughout the years provides a great deal of emphasis on community and morale. Um, so I'm happy to be here today and to have shared a little bit about what we do at the department and definitely I welcome any questions you might have.
Thank you so much, Erica. Does anybody have any questions? Sure, talk about preparation for your next assignment. What will you be doing to get ready to go? And then how does it work as far, will you be living at the embassy or you have housing you've got to take care of? How does that work? Yeah, no, that's a great question. It's, it's really exciting. I'm actually a little less than 12 weeks out. Um, and there's just so much involved with the preparation. <clears throat> Gratefully, in my case, I'm going to an English speaking country, but in general, the department, we have a language institute in Virginia. It's maybe about a 45 minute drive from where I live. And pretty much any of the, you know, 180 embassies and consulates around the world where you might serve, the department will be willing to give you language training um, to the extent that it's offered. And I think we offer language training in more than 40 languages at our institute. Um, so for instance, before I went to Mexico, I learned Spanish. Before I went to Cameroon, I learned French. Um, and that's literally full time. I spent six months doing nothing but learning Spanish, doing nothing but learning French five days a week. Um, and the idea is that when I get to post, I'll be able to be conversational. Consider it kind of a level three of five, right? So definitely not fluent. And I found that I would struggle more sometimes talking to my housekeeper than I would trying to talk to a government official because the, the type of language that they're teaching you at the Institute is geared toward the work that you'll be doing. So I can talk about nuclear nonproliferation, but I can't necessarily talk about what we need from the grocery store. Um, so it's, it's kind of a balance. In this case, I don't have to take language. So once I end this assignment, um, I'll have about two weeks off and then we'll get on a plane and head to Lesotho. I'm doing a few virtual classes. Um, so like I had to do an area studies course. Um, I'll be supervising a team of eight in my section. So I'll be the political economic counselor. There are only about 20, about 30 Americans at our embassy in Lesotho. And then we have about 80 local staff um, and I'll be supervising a mix of Americans and local staff. Um, and so, you know, taking some courses to prepare for supervising. Um, also, I'll be taking some global health dip diplomacy courses because for Lesotho, and this is issue specific for that country, Lesotho has the second or third highest HIV AIDS rate in the world, even though it's a super small country, only two, a little over 2 million people. Um, and so that health program that I talked about is going to be huge for where I'm heading next and the work that I'm doing. Um, also, I'll be taking some trafficking in person courses. Uh, trafficking in persons is a huge issue in the country where I'm going. Um, a lot of individuals trafficked from Lesotho into South Africa um, to work in mines and things like that. So trying to help um, the, the, the government create laws that are going to protect um, more individuals from falling victim to trafficking. Um, so on the, I just say more personal side, um, my husband, he currently works, and I was hearing just a few of the jobs here, and it's like, oh, this and all of that. Um, my husband, he works, he's a commercial real estate lender, and um, right now he's kind of framing how he's going to have the conversation with his boss. Um, you know, again, we're 12 weeks out, but hey, you know, I love doing this. I would love to still do it remotely. My family's moving to Lesotho, you know, so we're really praying that he'll be able to stay with his company uh, full time and just telework, come back to the States as often as he can. Um, but I'll say for my first two assignments, when we were in Mexico, he was able to telework for some time. But when we moved to Cameroon, the first time we moved to Africa as a family, he did have to leave his job. Um, so for him, it's constantly transition, uh, which makes it a bit challenging, I'd say. Um, from time to time, he's had to sacrifice a lot for me to be able to do this career um, and, and move around as much as we do. Um, my kids, they already know their new school. Yes, we'll have a house. Um, that's one of the benefits, I think, of working for the department as a foreign service officer. Part of the total compensation package is housing overseas. So whether I'm in Lesotho or I'm in France or I'm in the UK, the government is going to provide housing. Um, so while we are able to essentially live in government housing there and not have to pay for anything, uh, we're gonna try to maintain our home here so someone else can pay our mortgage here while we're living there. Um, so, you know, a, a, a nice, nice opportunity. Um, I'll only be there for two to three years. So, you know, excited to do it, but definitely still a lot to do in this next 12 weeks. I'd say probably chief among them is making sure my husband is set up with something. Wow. <laughs> That's all I have to say is wow. That's just so, so much. 
How long were you in Juarez and what was that like? Yeah, I was in Juarez for two years. And um, honestly, it was a very difficult time to be there. I was there from 2010 to 2012. And during that time, there was still quite a lot of cartel violence. And so you had the Federale police who were up from Mexico City, literally patrolling the streets day in and day out. We lost three colleagues who worked at the consulate with us. Two were um, mistakenly, I think, targeted to be affiliated with some sort of cartel and literally parents gunned down in their car. Um, and so it was a hard time, I think, emotionally for our mission um, and also just because every time we crossed the border from El Paso, I did feel a little bit of stress, even though I didn't like, I think internalize it at the time. Once we left the assignment, I realized, wow, I was kind of stressed for two years, you know? Um, and so, you know, I would say that it was difficult for that. That being said though, where we lived in Juarez, I felt pretty comfortable with, you know, um, it seemed like private citizens weren't able to keep weapons in Mexico. So that was a little, another like stressful thing because you know that they're like, you know, bad actors here who have weapons, but the guards who were patrolling our house 24 hours only have batons, right? Um, but still, I felt pretty safe in our neighborhood. We didn't have any issues. We lived about five minutes from a, wall, a, a mall in Juarez, and we would go there and take our kids, and, you know, other families would go there and take their families, and um, very family-friendly posts. Juarez is home of the burritos, so I, I had some of the best burritos I've ever had there in Juarez. Um, so now I think life is much different. Um, when I talk to people who are in Juarez now, there's not that same fear. Things are much, much better, I think, just from a safety perspective. Um, but when I was there, it was definitely challenging and, and, and kind of emotionally stressful. Did your children learn the language also? I wish, no, so that's the thing. So my, when I was in Juarez, my, my daughter, we only had one at that time and she was like one. I think she left, we were, she was under two. And she could say a few things like, you know, with, with our nanny, she was Spanish speaking. Um, so she would say a few things that, you know, I remembered her saying la luz when she went like the light turned on or something. But honestly, like she never maintained it. And because we went straight from Mexico to then speaking French in Cameroon, I also lost it. So like even now I'll hear people speaking Spanish and I can understand them for the most part, but whenever I get ready to, to respond, French just comes out. I think maybe because they're both romance languages and they're so similar, like I'm just, I'm a mess now. Like, and, and sometimes my husband, he'll be like, what's the word for this in French? And like, I can only think of the word of it in Spanish, right? So I'm just all messed up. Um, and so when we were in Cameroon, my oldest daughter, again, um, she was in a French speaking school there. So she was absolutely picking up, picking up and learned it. Um, but she doesn't speak any of it anymore. So that's, I think, one thing I'm looking forward to, um, not with Lesotho because it's English speaking, but we're hoping to go to another French speaking country potentially after um, my kids being able to pick up the language. Because you guys know how it is here in the States, right? Like it's almost considered like, you know, we're not like so many other countries where it's just like built in that you're learning a second language, right? So parents are paying tons of money to put their kids into language schools and, you know, things like that. It's like they're like the, it's something elite or special, whereas, you know, most of the most other places in the world, they're learning, they're growing up learning two or three languages. And so um, I'm looking forward to my kids being able to have that exposure again, I think, long term. Thank you. Are, are there assignments um, within the State Department uh, where family is not allowed to travel with you? Um, because I, I would have thought Juarez may have met that threshold. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. No, there are, I'd say maybe about, you know, and this is just a guess, probably about 20% of our assignments, you cannot have family travel with you. And actually when I was in Juarez, when I arrived there, I had my family with me. After about three months, they realized, oh, wow, things are really not looking good. And so they started giving us danger pay, which is essentially they'll pay you a little bit more money to be there. And they also gave our families the option to leave posts so they would provide find, you know, resources for your family to live apart from you while you were at post. Um, because it was just my husband and my young daughter, we chose to just stay together. 
Um, but I think had it been the other way around, if he was the officer and it was just, you know, me as the trailing spouse in that case, I probably would have left. A number of folks did. Um, a few of the places that remain what we call unaccompanied at this point, where just the officer can go on the continent of Africa, I can say, um, our mission in Somalia, our mission in the Central African Republic, our mission in Mali, I think is just adults only. So you can't bring any children, but if you are married, your spouse can come. And then of course you have what are considered our high priority assignments, which has pretty much been unaccompanied for years and years. And that's Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan. Um, but yeah, so I'd say about 20% of our missions, you can't bring family with you. It seems, uh, it seems like the, um, the, the model seems to be that you go out on assignment and then back to Virginia, DC area for, is that additional training and then, and then out on assignment and then back is that kind of the the career, the lifestyle of, of working at the State Department? It certainly can be. It's honestly a mixed bag. And I would say that most Foreign Service officers that I know, like if they join the service, they're planning to spend 80% of their career overseas. I have not followed that model. Um, so if they're coming back, they're only coming back for training, right? They're only coming back to go to the language institute that I talked about. And for instance, if you're going to learn Arabic or Chinese or Farsi um, and maybe a handful of other languages at our institute, you're literally taking an entire year here in the States to learn that language. And then they also give you another year overseas in that country learning the language. So literally you're spending two whole years to learn the language before you even start the job for two or three years. Um, and so, you know, most folks will spend their time overseas, but because of my family situation and my husband and really wanting to support his career, um, we've been in the States more time than I've actually spent overseas now. Um, so six years in the States, four years overseas so far of my, well, no, so seven years in the States, five years overseas. Um, so, you know, we'll be going back overseas now, but we've been here for a while just so he could kind of, you know, have some continuity and, you know, I'm sure you all, all understand because we, we've all seen so many different layers of this, but think of a candidate that you see and you see that they've had like seven different jobs in the last seven years, right? It makes it difficult sometimes. So the fact that he can build some kind of continuity has, has meant a lot to us. So trying to do it that way. Um, but the other caveat I'd say with that, there are a few department jobs for foreign service officers in other cities. So for instance, I have a colleague, she went and she did two years working for, um, you know, the mayor or something of Houston, right? So there are a few kind of odd jobs where we can do details in various places. Um, but, you know, those are kind of few and far between. Between. For the most part, if you're coming back to the U.S., you're either working at headquarters in D.C., doing training in D.C., or you're, you're overseas. Anybody else? Any other questions? Sorry, I just have one more question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's so interesting. Um, uh, so if somebody were to start um, being a, a foreign service officer and then decide I don't want to travel anymore. What what sort of career opportunities could you use your experience toward um, to kind of pivot to a, a domestic, um, you know, U.S. based career? So that's a really great question. It's something that I thought of, and I know colleagues have thought of, of hundreds of times. Um, we actually have like. Um, entire like magazines that we've dedicated to what is life looking like for people who decide not to do this anymore. I'd say though that the the department really tries to help um, employees to have flexibility. It has not always been that way, but particularly in recent years, just realizing people's lives are so different for various reasons. Mine, it's, you know, wanting to support my spouse's employment, but someone else, it may be elder care, right? You have aging parents back in the States, so you don't want to be living in Thailand for three years, that type of thing. And so there was a rule that changed last year where basically you couldn't spend more than six years consecutively in the U.S. I was maxing out my time, so 
why I got a waiver for a seventh year. So that's why I'm leaving in July. Um, but they've now eliminated that rule. So now you can stay in the US and do jobs domestically without a limit per se. Um, and also the department allows you to take leave without pay. So, you know, you can do that for up to four years now. So if I wanted to, after Lesotho, just take a break and just, you know what, I, I don't want to do, you know, foreign service anymore, um, or I just need a break from it, I could take leave without pay for pretty much any reason for up to four years. And, you know, I will say that to share two examples. I know um, one colleague, she took some leave without pay. She was planning to come back to the service, but instead opened a law firm in North Dakota, and that's where she is. And I have another colleague who took leave without pay, and she said, oh, well, let me go work for Amazon doing public policy because they're interested in government relations, too. Um, so a number of people that I know, they've done private sector, something looking at government relations, maybe for a large company, or being like an adjunct professor or professor or something in public policy or international relations. Um, a few I know have done um, like maybe supporting a school study abroad program or something like that, just because you have so much experience overseas, you're maybe able to speak to some things that students should be looking at um, in those experiences. Some have gone on to be language instructors. So, I mean, there's just a wider range of things. I think for me personally, though, one thing that is keeping us here is that in the foreign service at least it's you know kind of like being a teacher you're able to get a pension and for us you know i've been in 12 years i could retire at 20 years and get a full pension the trick for me is i have to be 50 i won't yet be 50 so i'll end up doing more time um, than just the 20 years but you're able to get a, a pension, which is nice, just in kind of terms of looking at financial security. My husband and I personally were into real estate investing. And so we kind of consider my job kind of like, you know, the base safety one. So he's able to take more risk on the real estate investing side. Um, so, you know, we'll see what happens after that. But I, I suspect that for me personally, I'll be doing hopefully we'll have 50 properties, right, by the time I retire so that we can just manage those and, and you know, try to help people find their dream home type thing. Uh, so that, that's what I think I might be interested in doing. Thank you so much, Erica, for joining us today. And, um, you know, the talk, it, it was just a great, great opportunity for us to see what you do. So um, what, I, uh, what I'd like to do is uh, move on, but if anybody has any other questions, um, then we can go ahead and ask after. Uh, so let's go ahead and move on with um, Casey as the fine master. Welcome to our fine time. A um, couple, I'll find myself quickly, one for being late and two for having bad internet today. So uh, if I drop out, it's not because I didn't want to be here. Thank you for everything you just shared, Eric. That was fabulous. So. Let's pass it on to the fine time. So what would you like to find yourself about to talk about? You can talk about what's fine, what's not fine, or get on a soapbox and just complain. Not really. Uh, we'll charge you 10 times for that. Well, I have two things that are fine. One, for $10, this is a green presentation. I learned a lot, so thank you for that. And two, my daughter, who's in the third grade, just finished the Harry Potter series. I'm very proud of her and just wanted to celebrate with you guys. So is that, is that 10 or $20 that you just find yourself? Total 20, but two $10 ones. Oh, that's good. If you're a guest here for the first time, we find ourselves by choice because we know that uh, we like to talk. So basically we're finding ourselves to talk and we put the money towards the Rotary International and the good things we do throughout the year. Does anybody else want to find themselves? I will find yeah, myself. I'll find you got to wait, Steve. Lauren's up. That's fine. Fifteen dollars for my uh, poor performance with the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> and I'll follow that up by finding myself fifteen dollars for having Lauren fill in for my Pledge of Allegiance unexpectedly. <laughs> I was also late; and had some unexpected work stuff come up, so fifteen dollars for me. Excellent. Go ahead, Steve, and I will. I'll find myself $10 for missing last week's meeting. I apologize. I was in a six hour, six and a half hour compliance meeting. So I promise I would have rather been at a rotary meeting, uh, but I apologize for not being there. Uh, Steve, but you're compliant now. So why don't you make that 
that's enough out of you. <laughs> a bunch of delinquents running around this place. I, uh, my five dollar late fee since I wasn't the last one here. I I'm gonna find myself ten dollars um, because Steve has been trying to get a hold of me and get time to work <laughs> on QuickBooks for probably about 10 days now and I've blown him off every time because uh, I've been busy but uh, I I know that I owe you time Steve so I, I will give you a call this afternoon. It's all good man no problem. I will find myself two five dollar uh, uh, fines one five dollar I literally just want by uh, listening to Erica I want to change my career. <laughs> And then um, the other fine, I didn't get a chance to introduce uh, Elaine. El can you introduce yourself? E Elaine, you don't have to find yourself to introduce yeah, yourself. I find myself She's for you. finding herself and you get to talk. <laughs> My name is Eileen McCormick Place and I'm with the State Department. I'm just here to make sure that Erica got on okay and to thank you all so much for allowing the State Department to come um, and to uh, to speak to you during the pandemic. This has been an amazing opportunity that we have reached over 50, I have reached over 50 Rotary Clubs. We have someone else um, going with uh, your competitor, I guess, Kiwanis. Um, but it's been great because we've been all over the country, places that we normally don't reach. And I have to say, my son went to school in Pasadena, which I guess isn't too far from you. And I remember how beautiful it was out there in the beautiful mountains. So I'm very jealous that you all get to live out there. And here we are in, on the East Coast. But thank you so much for having Erica here today. Eileen, we will only have to find you $5 for calling us competitors. We're not actually competitors because we're both serving the same mission to change the world. Uh, we just carry different names and labels. But uh, we'll let that one slide today. But come back and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll convince you that Rotary is better. <laughs> well, you know, Kiwanis is, is Native American for I want to be a Rotarian. So... <laughs> It's, it's few and far between that we get to tell that joke, but every time we get a chance, Raymond's going to drop it. Drop that joke. All right, Diva, we need to move on. We're running out of time. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, okay, um, next is the Fast Craft Talk. Do we have someone speaking? I think that's me. It is. <laughs> Oh, yay. Okay, go. <laughs> so, as you guys know, my name is Lauren Ferrari. I grew up in Glendora and went through the school system there. Um, graduated from Glendora High School. After high school, I decided I didn't want to continue going to school, so I joined the United States Air Force. Um, did one tour in Iraq and was in the Air Force for about six years. Came home, decided I wanted to be a police officer, became a police officer for the city of Azusa. I'm currently a corporal over there. I've had a ton of different assignments. Um, previously loved my job. Things are changing now. Um, realized the importance of school. Went back to school and I just graduated a couple of months ago with my master's degree from Azusa Pacific University in leadership. Um, and most importantly, I have two kids, which you guys met my son last week, Max, and then my little baby girl, Tessa. And that's pretty much all there is to know about me. Well, thank you so much and congratulations for graduating. Oh, nice. quite, quite an accomplishment. Well, everything that you just said, quite an accomplishment. <laughs> so thank you for that. So next we'll go on to Action 360. Uh, so the update for the House of Ruth project. Um, those that can help out on Saturday, um, I hope that you guys can, can make it. We're gonna do the um, drop off of um, the items, or I should say, well, people will come and drop off the items at um, the Mason Lodge. And I believe it's from 10 to two, right, Raymond? Correct. Yeah, 10 to two. Uh, Marianne's gonna be there helping, <laughs> helping uh, collect any uh, funny, any funny, any funds that are, <laughs> are in money that's gonna be donated. Uh, Marianne, so we'll please come if you have Yes. <laughs> so if you can come and help us out, um, I did put, go ahead and put in an order for quite a bit of things from our part of the donation. Um, so Mike, I know you had sent out an, um, 
an email. Um, I did also look on their their um, social media site, and they did um, list a couple of things that are, they were in dire need of, and it was blankets, um, TVs with wall mounts, and um, the shower curtains with like the rings and everything. So I did purchase about eight blankets, um, different sizes. Um, but I also looked into their uh, Amazon Smile account, and they um, I did buy a couple of other things on there um, that they they listed. So um, yeah, I got I'm very excited. Thank, that you. Thank you for that. And oh. I also got an email um, from Rhonda Beltran. Um, I, I okay. know her through the chamber, um, and okay. I actually didn't realize that she was at House, uh, House of Ruth now, uh, but she replied directly uh, from my email and gave me that same list, um, the shower liner. Okay, good. Um, yeah, shower curtains, all, the, all that stuff. Okay, good. Well, thank you, everybody, that's, that's helping out, and, um, you know, hopefully you guys can come and, and help on Saturday, and we can um, go ahead and drop off. Oh, drop off. Um, Rhonda did say Monday would be mostly in the afternoon. She, she's not available in the morning. So um, she's hoping anytime after one o'clock, if that fits into the schedule. If not, then I can figure out another day that we can go drop off. I just need to know. Mike, is one o'clock in the afternoon good for you on Monday? Yeah, sorry, I was just looking at my calendar. Uh, yes, I, I can make that work. All right, I'll see you at 1 o'clock. So on Friday, the uh, city- 1 o'clock at the lodge? Yes. Okay, I'll and change that. Friday afternoon, the city's dropping off from their, their donations. Surf Pro's dropping off on Saturday from 12 to 2. We receive financial donations, I believe, 250 from the San Dimas Masonic Lodge, 250 from our Rotary Club, 200 from the Arcadia Masonic Lodge, 200 from a corporation that's related somehow to Casey and $50 from a private individual. So we raised quite a bit of funds on this also. So it's looking good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to add on Raymond? Any for action 360? No. Okay. So the calendar. The calendar, we got a big calendar coming up. So uh, We've got the House of Ruth next week to talk about uh, teen violence and also a final recap on the award. We've got the VOA, Haynes Family Programs. But the interesting thing is beginning in May, we're going to be reaching out across the country, really across the world. We have a coral reef environment. And then the Trickster Cultural Center, Native American veterans from the uh, north part of the Midwest. Um, we've got a cultural exchange, Be the Match, helping. Lead. Now we've got, we've got three authors coming in. Helping leaders go beyond merely communicating will be in June. Three Seconds in Munich, the controversial 1972 Olympic basketball will be in July. And then, uh, as you can see, the, the program fills out all the way to the 25th, where we're going to be talking about ending soil erosion in Haiti for economic development. So we got a really good calendar through the mid part of the summer. Yes, thank you so much. Um, so if you guys can um, get speakers to come in for the um, craft talk, right? We need some? We do. So if you guys, if you know anybody that's interested in sharing what they do for, for about five, six minutes, that'd be great. So moving along um, with uh, Mike for the four-way test. All right, uh, the rotary four-way, uh, was that someone else? No, okay. Uh, all right, the uh, Rotary four-way test was developed in 1932 um, by a Rotarian, and this is just sort of an ethics code uh, that we apply as Rotarians to everything that we think, say, and do. Um, the best way to think about this is, is really a four-way stop, um, crossroads with a, an intersection in the middle. Um, if if whatever you are thinking, saying, or doing passes all four of these tests, then you can be confident that, um, that you are acting in good faith and that your, um, your intentions are, are ethically sound. Uh, so the four-way test is, uh, is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned. And that is today's four-way test.
I think you're muted, Diva. Diva, we've got about 10 minutes, about nine minutes. If anybody has questions for Erica or uh, Miss Place, because uh, I know I have one. Um, one of my very good friends is a diplomatic courier. So I know there are, and he's got like a coolest job in the world, I think. What are some of the other jobs in the State Department? Eileen, did you want to go first? No. <laughs> You're a good one. You go first. You know more. Oh, I, I was just, um, so yes, there's so many. Well, first, I said we're about 70,000 strong. And I want to say that at least 25,000 of our jobs are civil service. Um, so those employees primarily will work in the Washington, D.C. expert in Washington, D.C. area, and I consider them our experts on like all the policy issues that you could, you know, think about, like just, they're the experts, they're the folks that in some cases have been there 30 years, they know how it works, you know, they're able to talk to each administration that comes in um, and explain the ins and outs of the way things have gone. Um, also, there are a number of foreign service specialist jobs. So I'm a generalist, so my, you, you, you select tracks. The tracks are public diplomacy, management, political, economics, and um, consular. So I'm an economic officer. Um, that being said, though, I'm a generalist, so I'm expected to be able to do anything. And so kind of jack of all trades, master of none. So right now I'm getting ready to go do a political economic job. But, you know, my previous post, I was doing consular work. It's all over the place. Um, and then there are foreign service specialists, not a generalist. And those folks will be our medical practitioners, our diplomatic couriers, our office management specialists. Um, so, for instance, I had a colleague. She, um, she used to be... Um, I don't know what she did, but she, I remember she worked for Morgan Stanley, she said for like 20 years, and then she decided to leave and join the, the Foreign Service as a specialist for office management, so that at our embassy, she basically ran them, right? She was able to kind of control, this is how we're going to um, have our op, you know, offices function, this is how we're going to get things on the calendar for the ambassador, et cetera. Um, and then there's also technical specialists, so our IT specialists, security specialists, um, so we do have um, security specialists who manage not only the paper at our embassy, so all the classified information, but also just try to help to keep us safe. So for instance, before I went to Juarez, I had to be in close contact with our security specialist who was already posted there to know, don't go to this part of town, don't do this, that type of stuff. Um, those are some of the main tracks though, but you can go generalist, specialist, or civil service. So those are kind of the three, I'd say, main buckets of employment, I would say. Aside from just being like, you could be a contractor for a company and, you know, just come do a contract for the Department of State in, in any one of those areas. So Eileen, I do, I don't know if I'm, you think I'm missing anything big there. I think you, I think you have it well covered, but it is kind of amazing some of the different jobs from a historian, um, to teachers, to medical staff. Um, there's, there's a lot more people. And in the embassies too, they're not all just State Department people. They are people from all different uh, departments of the government. So it's a, a fascinating group. I'm civil service, so I've never been overseas. Uh, I'm one of the ones who stays here in Washington for 40 years. Um, but So it's always interesting to hear someone like Erica talk about her experiences overseas. And what kind of education does that require for if somebody is, you know, fresh out of high school, wanting to go to college and wanting to pursue a career, uh, what would they want to do to be able to do what you ladies do? I almost want to say none, right? Because you can really come from anywhere and do this. Um, I was right near you all at Pepperdine. That's where I went to grad school and I studied public policy. But I have friends who are much better foreign service officers, much better diplomats than I am. And they were art history majors or just all sorts of things. And so the background doesn't really matter so much. It's just being able to get through the process. And so the process is you almost take something like an SAT. It's called the foreign service officer test. And it tests your general knowledge of a wide range of things. So it's geography on their history, some, you know, current events, math um, to some extent, or like econ type questions. And you pass that test is step one. 
and then you'll do an oral assessment where they'll fly you to DC and you'll basically spend a day interviewing with folks and doing group exercises to see how you can, you know, solve problems. And then based on that, kind of get through the process. So for someone in high school, that's where I first got interested in it. Um, I, I would like went to Barnes and Nobles and you can pick up books just as you can to prep for the SAT to prep for the foreign service officer test. So I picked up a few of those to get a sense of the type of questions they would ask on the exam. Um, and I would say that of everyone and this, these statistics may be old, but these are at least what they were a few years ago of everyone that takes the foreign service officer test maybe about 20% will pass it the first time, but you could take it as many times as you want. Um, so about 20% will pass the test. And then of everyone who takes the oral exam who gets invited to do that next step, about 20% will pass. And so for me, when I took the oral exam, there were 10 people and two of us passed that day. But that being said, you can enter back into the process. It takes, you have to wait like a year between when you take it but just enter back in the process and, and do it again. Um, and again, these are, I'm telling you like truly, one of the best diplomats I know, he is amazing. He's on his way to Martania, a small um, African country, nice island country. Um, he is, um, he took the foreign service oral exam three times. So literally it took him like three years of taking the test to even get in the door but he's much better at this than I am. He's, you know, clearly choosing to make a career of it for him and his family. So I just, I encourage folks to apply, but at the same time that you're applying, don't leave your day job. Just take the test, see how it goes, see if you get through the process. And if you end up getting an invitation to join the foreign service, it sometimes takes as long as a year, right? Sometimes 18 months. Um, then, you know, then you can pick up everything and leave. But that's the way that I would approach it for someone thinking about it in high school. Take the test, see how it goes, but kind of have a plan B would be my advice. Um, Eileen, I don't know if you had thoughts. Yeah, I would add in there that uh, internships are a fabulous opportunity. You have to be the, of a junior level standing in college. I mean, you, you may have enough, you know, as a freshman, sometimes they have enough credits to be considered a junior these days with all the advanced classes they take. But you, if you are thinking about the Foreign Service or just want to look at the State Department and see what we you know, do, I think every student should think about doing an uh, internship in Washington just to kind of understand, not that we even understand what Washington does, but just to kind of come to Washington and, and, and see it's a whole different world out here. I'm not saying it's great, but it's a whole different world and it's important for everybody to see, no, it's great. It's a good opportunity. And we have fabulous interns that come into the State Department. They're not paid. Uh, but they come to the State Department, they can go to the embassies, and it's a, a great opportunity. It's all year, so you have a better chance of getting an internship if you're there in the fall or the spring than you are in the summer, because more people, you know, want to be there in the summer. But I've had just fabulous interns um, who really have helped us out so much and have really learned about the State Department and what we do. So that's my plug. And it does take about nine months to get the internship because you have to get a, a clearance, and that is just a long process. So they can go to our website, www.state.gov and look up internships, careers, or if they're just studying about a country, we have a fabulous website that will give you all kinds of information about our relations. So I recommend that.